Well, the World Series is over. Congrats to the Dodgers and blah, blah, blah. Hey, we finally have some Cardinals news to talk about. What's going on, everyone? And welcome into this edition of B-Shafe Daily. Brendan Schaefer with you, back and ready to go on a long and adventurous Cardinals offseason. I think that's what it's going to be as the St. Louis Cardinals, we all know by now, ready to go through a retool, a reset, a rebuild, might be the most honest way to talk about it. The Cardinals don't want you to say that. We're ready to cover it all right here on B-Shafe Daily and the Brendan Schaefer St. Louis Cardinals writer channel and the day after the World Series. The Cardinals already making news and making moves as it pertains to how that roster is going to shake out in 2025. We'll talk today about the options declined by the Cardinals on Thursday and what it sort of sets the stage for as we look ahead to what the future of the Cardinals could be. And as much as we love baseball season, I am kind of glad the World Series is over so that we can finally get to the point on what the Cardinals offseason is going to entail because we've known that it's maybe not going to be the most pleasant and we know there are going to be changes made to the roster and decreases made to the payroll, but it's a lot of stuff that we want to be able to dig in on and talk about. So I am ready for it. If you're out there in Cardinals land, ready for it too, make sure you guys hit that subscribe button and consider supporting the channel with a channel membership. You can find the link to do so down in the video description, as well as the link to Underdog Fantasy. I'm proud to be partnering with Underdog Fantasy, my favorite place to play fantasy games. If you check out their pick them, you can have some fun. It's easy to play by picking two to eight stats of your favorite players and choosing whether they'll go higher or lower. It is just that simple. And if it sounds like fun, you can sign up now with promo code BSHAFE to claim your free pick and your first time deposit offer up to $1,000 in bonus cash. Check out the Underdog Fantasy link and promo code in the description to the video if that sounds fun to you. And with NFL, NBA, NHL all underway, it's that prime sports season, so Make it a little bit more interesting with Underdog Fantasy. You must be 18 or older and present in a state where Underdog Fantasy operates. Terms apply. Concerned with your play, call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit ncpgambling.org. Let's get into it, though, Cardinals fans. The news from Thursday. Cardinals announcing, and this has been officially announced as of this recording, that Lance Lynn, Kyle Gibson, and Keenan Middleton, three veteran pitchers from the team, will not have their options exercised or picked up by the Cardinals for 2025. All will become free agents immediately, thus clearing three spots on the Cardinals' 40-man roster. Two of these guys were pretty much mainstays last year in your starting rotation, of course, Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson. Middleton would have been a mainstay, but he missed the entire season with injury and never did throw a pitch for the Cardinals, and probably at this point seems like he never will. Before things really got ramped up in terms of, oh, yeah, the Cardinals are absolutely going to trim payroll and this is going to be miserable, before that sort of set in, I had kind of had half a mind that the Cardinals would consider picking up the Keenan Middleton option. I think it's only an additional $5 million, a $6 million total, because you got to count the $1 million buyout. And that's the case, by the way, for all three of these pitchers. The Cardinals are paying $3 million in total, a million to each, to decline these options, as it was described when those guys were signed as part of the guarantees toward their total financial outlay. Uh, you take the 2024 guaranteed salary, add a million to it, and that's why people might say, well, Kyle Gibson was guaranteed $13 million, but he only had a $12 million salary for last year. Well, you add the million dollars to that because whether the Cardinals picked up the option and he got an additional $12 million or they declined it as they did and he gets the $1 million, that's still guaranteed money. So basically, I think the math works out on this, and if anybody wants to correct me, you can go ahead and do so, but I think this is accurate. $11 million would have been the additional salary paid to Gibson to keep him on the team for 2025. $9 million would have been the additional salary paid to Lynn to keep him on the team for 2025. For him, it's $10 million minus the million-dollar bonus, or not a bonus, but a, a buyout to get him out of the contract here, to get the Cardinals out of the contract, that is. And then Middleton, it would have been an additional $5 million, $6 million minus the $1 million buyout. So $25 million in total, if my math is correct, that the Cardinals are saving by the moves that they made on Thursday. And the the Middleton one, knowing what we know now, after the end-of-season press conference where the Cardinals and John Mozeliak admitted we expect the payroll to go down, the Middleton one is hardly a surprise because you're just not going to spend an additional $5 million on a middle reliever, especially one that you didn't even see pitch for you last year. And look, I think he he did bring value to the, the, the bullpen in terms of experience, and you would have gotten a lot more out of that if he actually gotten to pitch. Uh, but this 2025 Cardinals team, 
you're not really paying for veteran leadership. Like that's not the direction they're going to go because they tried that last year and they didn't make the playoffs. That was off of a season that was a disastrous 71 and 91. So the Cardinals are shifting and I, a lot of people out there, let me know in, in the comments your thoughts, Cardinals fans. A lot of people, I think, are going to be okay with these moves that have been announced today and definitely not surprised by them based on the tenor that we heard from that end-of-season presser and the direction we all expect the Cardinals to go. I don't think this comes as a shock to anybody. Um, the Lynn one, we've sort of been greasing the wheels and telling you, yeah, the way that ended with Lance Lynn at the end of the season when he uh, had that one final start, it went well at Bush Stadium, and it, it, he, they could have had him start on turn that final Sunday of the the home schedule. And then obviously, you know, dealing with injury and stuff, he was never going to go on that road trip. They just decided to IL him right after that start, not having him go one more time on that final Sunday at Bush because he was able to kind of end it on his terms. He was pitching through injury with the, the knee the whole time anyway, and they weren't playing for anything by that point in the calendar. So kind of like with Adam Wainwright at the end of last season when he had that one start to get win number 200 and it went so well. Yeah, could he have conceivably tried to pitch another time? There was room on the schedule to do it. Yeah, but why would you at that point when you know that this is your last year? Lance Lynn may or may not retire from baseball, but he won't be back with the Cardinals. And like I kind of geared us toward back at the end of the regular season in September, once Lynn had that start and you heard the way that it was talked about after, you knew that that was going to be the case, that the Cardinals would not be picking up his option. It, It seemed to be telegraphed at the time. Same thing with Middleton, uh, not maybe telegraphed by the Cardinals, but just based on, oh, yeah, they're going to spend a lot less money. They're not going to be bringing back a $5 million middle reliever uh, who they never got to see at all last year anyway. Well, Kyle Gibson's the one that's interesting, though. That's the one that you can look at and say, all right, this is really a sign, Cardinals fans, that you might need to buckle the heck up for what this offseason could bring. Because when you look at this rotation and who you've got now on the books coming back, it thins out rather quickly, right? You have still Sonny Gray, and that's up in the air. We're going to talk a lot about Sonny Gray. We're going to talk a lot this offseason about Nolan Arenado and a lot about Wilson Contreras. And I think at least one of those guys is likely to not be on the team next year. And it may be just whichever one has the most possible trade value where the Cardinals don't have to eat money or as much money to get rid of the contract. It may be that one of those three personalities demands or requests to be out of the situation because the Cardinals don't have their eye on contending in 2025. And these guys are in their thirties, some of them deeper into their thirties than others, and might be looking to be on a winning team before they retire. I don't think for any of the guys it's around the corner that they're retiring, but you get into your thirties and you want to win. You want to taste that championship as many times as you can. And I think all three were brought into St. Louis under the guise of, hey, you're going to be part of a competitive core and we're going to do a lot of winning here. And it just hasn't happened. So you could understand if any or all of them might say, eh, maybe get in contact with my agent and say if there's an opportunity to be shipped elsewhere that I do have a better chance to win. And maybe I can be a little selective about where I could land, find myself a nice pillowy, cushiony landing spot, then that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Maybe that's something that could happen for one or more of these three veteran players that we will talk about throughout this offseason. But in terms of the rotation, right now you do have Sonny Gray. After that, Eric Fetty should be noted. That $7.5 million contract and that salary for next season is affordable. It's the whole reason the Cardinals traded Tommy Edman. I know it's probably difficult over the last couple of weeks to watch Tommy Edmond contributing to a Dodgers World Series championship. Feel great for Tommy Edmond, by the way. I just think it's awesome that he is now a world champion and did it in a way where he was you know, meaningfully contributing. He was the NLCS MVP. He scored the final run and the winning run of the World Series on that sacrifice fly by Mookie Betts. Just kind of crazy to think about the journey for Tommy Edmond, the frustration that had to be involved going all the way back into the winter and then finding out, as the public did, about January or so about his off-season surgery, and then he wasn't ready for spring training, and then he wasn't ready after that, and it was still just a, a number of setbacks. And then when he finally got healthy, the Cardinals you know, trade him, and he ends up becoming a real contributor for the Dodgers. Just a really cool story. Uh, Jack Flaherty, world champion as well. He started the game last night. Didn't pitch well, um, but... He got to, you know, drink a lot of alcohol last night anyway. He got to got to be part of that champagne celebration, and he's a world champion as well. Uh, but the, the the rest of the Dodgers bailed him out, as did the Yankees. Oh, my goodness, that fifth inning was just 
one of the worst innings of of lackadaisical baseball that you'll ever see. Uh, Garrett Cole will never live down his inability to cover first base. I just could not believe it. Let me know in the comments if you were watching that last night because, uh, wow, that was something else. But congrats to Jack. Congrats to Tommy Edmond. I think Joe Kelly gets a ring, too, because he was on the he was on the Dodgers, but he wasn't on the uh, playoff roster, postseason roster. I think he was injured is the reason for that. But anyway, nevertheless, we're talking about the Cardinals rotation. I do get sidetracked often, easily. But it, it, you got Eric Fetty. You got Sonny Gray. It, for now, we'll see about Sonny. But let's just say you do have him, and then we'll go through what it might look like when you don't have him. Sonny Gray, Eric Fetty. Miles Michaelis is under contract for the season. Nobody's super excited about that, but that's the reality of where, what it is. Uh, I saw Derek Gould recently write about uh, Stephen Matz. He's technically under contract and technically could serve as a starting pitcher. I don't know how much you're going to get out of him, but the Cardinals are in a position right now where it, they're already paying the money. They're already on the hook for whatever salary Matz and Michaelis are going to make. So unless you have a lot of faith in the, the number of prospects and young pitchers that were in the minors last year that can make the leap and actually not just perform well, but do it over volume, right? Give you innings. Because that was the reason that Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson were here in the first place this past season is the Cardinals looked at what they had depth-wise and they said, we don't have those guys that are just bursting at the seams ready to emerge and join a big league rotation and throw 150, 160 innings reliably. They just didn't believe that the Zach Thompsons and the Libertors and the the, the Tink Henses and the, you could talk about Roberts uh, and Kloff and Steenstein, like all those guys, they just didn't rightfully uh, believe that that was going to be a, a leap that they could make. Now you happen to fall into Andre Pallante becoming an answer. Um, you would also be right to mention Michael McGreevy and Gordon Graceffo as two guys that they didn't necessarily believe were ready to make that leap. And I think that was right, but I think by the end of the season, Michael McGreevy has shown he at least deserves a look to be a guy that can throw 160 big league, you know, replacement level innings next year. He doesn't have to be great, but if he's a 4.5 ERA and, and and throws 160 innings, that's that's more than enough to justify his rotation spot on a team next year that is not going to come into the season. Um, be, whether you talk about what the Cardinals are going to be describing, I'm sure if you talk to Ollie Marnell, he's going to say we're going to look to win and, and compete. But realistically, I think if you talk about Vegas win totals and expectations from the public, the Cardinals are going to be a team that is expected to finish below 500 next year. Like their their win total is going to be 77 and a half or 79 and a half or whatever it's going to be in Vegas for those who who partake in the sports betting. That's what it's going to be because this roster is going to see people leave it and it's not going to see uh, the, 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 the appropriate amount of talent replacing the guys that are going to be able to say, yeah, the Cardinals won 80-something games last year. They're going to do it again. I think it's going to be a win total that the, the public expects to be below 500. And then the Cardinals will have an opportunity with the young players that they'll be relying upon to conceivably outperform that. But I don't know that it's going to be the the mean expectation that they're going to do it. We're going to be able to spend a lot of time talking about, well, if Walker gets 10% better and Gorman gives you 10% more than he did last year and on down the list... The Cardinals could end up with a very similar season where they're kind of on the outskirts of wildcard contention or if the division ends up being a week one in 2025 and 85 games should win it, then you might be in that mix. But uh, that's going to take a lineup that finally produces above what it's done the last two years with less because Goldie's going to be gone, obviously. Um, And for as much as he didn't have a great season this year or even a normal Goldie level season in 2023, then... You know, that is still production that you, league value production, league uh, league average production, if you will, that you have to replace. And much like with where the Cardinals were from a pitching perspective coming into 2024, it doesn't automatically happen that guys fall out of trees from AAA and they show up and they have, you know, league average production in your lineup if, if you're calling upon them. Like if it's a Luke and Baker or whoever it is, th- those things have to happen. Thomas and JC, those guys have to not be, you know, Get some guy, sometimes guys come up to the big leagues and they're run over and it's like, oh, they're not they're not ready for this level or they're not fit for this level. From a pitching perspective, that that's even more of a noticeable thing. It's exactly how they lost 91 games in 2023. When they had some injuries, they had some underperformance, and you're like, oh, the bottom fell out and there's nobody to come up and replace it. And so we're just going to bring up all these random guys, Casey Lawrence and Andrew Suarez and 
Jacob Barnes and these dudes that are just going to have to eat it like it's a, like it's a triple A team because that's what you see a lot of times in triple A. It's like, oh boy, we're down by a lot. Well, somebody somebody out there in that bullpen is throwing the next four innings. That's how the 2023 Cardinals felt uh, the final two months of the season. The Cardinals then said, all right, we're not going to let that happen again. We have to try and put our best foot forward to make the playoffs. Lance Lynn, Kyle Gibson, those are two guys that have been around the block. They won't let something like that happen. And to their credit, they did not. They did not let something like that happen. The Cardinals had a 500 or better record this year. And that being said, the total production wasn't enough to get him into the playoffs. 3.84 ERA from Lance Lynn, he was fine. 4.24 4.24 ERA from Kyle Gibson. He was fine. Combined, they had 1.2 wins above replacement, according to baseball reference. I think fan graphs had them combined for like 2.8 wins above replacement. But the Cardinals spent like $24 million or whatever it was on those two guys for a couple wins above replacement. It's a situation now where is it likely that Michael McGreevy has a two-win season in 2025 if he starts 30 games? Is he a two-wins-above-replacement guy? Probably not. I wouldn't say that that's the median or mid, you know, mean average expectation, but could it happen that he pitches better than you think and he does it for free because they're not paying him $12 million or whatever? Andre Palante, could he do the same thing? And, you know, Palante's numbers this past season were probably, if I check him out from a war perspective, 1.6 wins above replacement by himself, according to baseball reference. That's more than the combined total of war for Lynn and Gibson, according to baseball reference. And fan graphs may be a little bit different, but you get the idea. The Cardinals are going to lean on guys like Palante and McGreevy to take, and I know that like you can't see it directly because Palante was in the rotation while Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson were, so he's not taking one of their spots, but he wasn't in the rotation to begin 2024. So if you look at the, the day one 2024 rotation and compare it to what it's going to be now, Palante and McGreevy will slide in for Lynn and Gibson. All right, Those are two things that are happening. If Gray, Michaelis, and Mats are still here, those can be your other three, and you've gotten a lot cheaper in your rotation without necessarily, because again, all Palante and McGreevy have to do is be like a one-war guy apiece, and you've done basically what Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson did for you at a lot cheaper price, which in, in the way that it was described by John Mosellock to Derek Gould today, I saw his tweet, he said it provides, quote, maximum flexibility. They're looking for flexibility. Okay, but that's kind of going to be an empty promise, I feel, because I don't know how much that flexibility is then going to be poured back into the major league payroll. I think it's just going to be cost savings for the most part. I'll be a big skeptic until I see the Cardinals go out and spend, because I think there is still room for the Cardinals to go, hey, this six million dollar player that we can sign to a contract or this guy we're going to sign for two years and and eight million total. It's not going to be a big financial outlay like those Lynn and Gibson deals were, relatively speaking. But this guy actually might give you more bang for your buck. The Cardinals need to find those types of free agents, and it's not often been a strength of this front office. But Bloom is in the front office now. And even though he doesn't have a role, he doesn't have a title, I I think they're still calling him Cardinals advisor or whatever they're they're titling him as. He's the pobo in waiting. I still think he is, as much as he is going to be focused on everything underneath the hood, trying to get the minors and the, the developmental program going, I also think that there's this, this. It's his baby next year. Mo's gone after this year, so he's going to have a hand in in maybe identifying some of those pieces that you can bring in on the on the cheap, where it, it, it will feel like bargain bin and it will feel like dumpster diving. But dumpster dive effectively if you're going to do it right. Like that's a. It, it's not to say that Gibson and Lynn weren't you know nice guys to have around, and they wanted to, to lean in on the veteran leadership. And you know what? It got them about where all the, all the Cardinals fans expected it might get them, 84 wins or whatever it was. And, and that's not enough to make the playoffs. So the Cardinals are going to shift, and they're going to say, let's look at it on paper and, and less about trying to, to capture the intangibles of paying money for veteran leadership and, and putting a dollar value on that. Cardinals won 83 games, not 84. Instead of doing that, they're going to say, what's the wins above replacement? What's the replacement value that these guys can offer for a lot cheaper? And maybe set a foundation that way. And, it, like, I understand the Cardinals weren't able to go into last year, 2024, doing that because they didn't know Palante was going to be able to do this at the time. And reasonably speaking, McGreevy probably would not have if you had plugged him into the rotation day one last year. But I think he grew in 2024 and is now ready for the opportunity. So it fits the timeline a little bit for the Cardinals to to go ahead and, and take the plunge and let McGreevy try it. 
and I expect that he'll go into spring training with every opportunity to earn a spot. And it may be sort of like Mason Wynn last year, where he didn't really perform in September of 2023 at the big league level, but the Cardinals came into this past year going, he's going to be our shortstop. Like we've set our roster up that he has to be. The Cardinals might set their roster up and, and their organizational depth up for McGreevy to have to be in the rotation. And I'm not one that really has a problem with that, understanding the direction that they're going to go. Um, look, would it be cool to see the Cardinals still go out and identify the type of Seth Lugo contract that the Royals were able to come up with as a diamond in the rough last off season? Three years, $45 million, $15 million a, a season, and he ends up being a Cy Young candidate? Like, that'd be great because that's not much more than you paid Leonard Gibson, but you knew that Lynn and Gibson would not be Cy Young candidates if you brought him back in 2025. So that's where I'm like, you're at least shedding the the notion of we're going to pay for these very low upside options. Like I had started the podcast talking about, the Gibson one is the one that you thought, okay, you do want to be semi-competitive. You do want to be respectable, and and Gibson can give you that. He can give you another 4.2, 4.3 ERA and throw 170 innings. He could probably do that in 2025 for the, the 11 million additional dollars or whatever it would be. He could do that. Um, but the Cardinals are, it's not that they're setting their sights higher than that. They're just leaving the door open for maybe we're going to find out about a Michael McGreevy instead, which is interesting. Uh, the name I have not mentioned when I go through that and say, compare last year's rotation to what it could be this year, Eric Fetty is still floating around. So that's where it's kind of like Fetty is locked in. And I think Steven Matz is the guy that has to come into spring and prove that he deserves a spot. Or he could just be a really expensive bullpen arm that in a season where you're not necessarily living and dying with every every win or every save situation or or every, you know, it's just not going to be the, the top of mind priority for the Cardinals to have to make the playoffs or there's hell to pay. That's not going to be the attitude. Um, from, from the dugout, it will be. But from the front office, they're going to be more understanding. But you're going to look at a guy like Matt and go, well, he can probably throw 100 innings. We're just going to use him when we need to kind of mop stuff up. Like, they could do that with Steven Matz. It's going to be interesting to see how they want to approach it. But the way I look at it is you could also see Sonny Gray traded. And if that ends up being the case, suddenly your rotation, and I'll try to put him in order, but it's going to be kind of gnarly to do that, would be Fetty, Polante, uh, Michaelis, McGreevy, Matz. And, like, that's your five. Could very well be the case, or the Cardinals could go out and find a starter or an arm that's that we, we don't necessarily know who it is yet, but it's a guy that they're going to pay $7 million a year to, and the, the median expectation for what that guy's going to do isn't very high, but he surprises you. He ends up being a diamond in the rough. He ends up being a value signing. The Cardinals are going to need to dumpster dive on a few of those types of contracts if they're going to surprise people and have a winning season again in 2025. I'm not counting them out. I think it could happen. I'm just trying to articulate that I don't think it will be the median expectation. So that's what's going on with the Cardinals after Thursday's news. No Lance Lynn, no Kyle Gibson, no Keenan Middleton. It's the first of what should be a a very uh, newsworthy offseason for the Cardinals because we just, there are a lot of names that may not be here by the time spring training opens. What I expect one of Arenado, Gray, Contreras to be gone, yes. Um, and I would even probably say, and this is just me speculating, it's more likely to be one of Sonny Gray or Arenado. And if I really had to pin it down, I think Arenado would be maybe the most likely to go. Um, but Gray is right there too. Contreras, I just feel like, ends up staying, even though from a roster perspective, you might want to get a look if you're really not trying to contend. And this isn't a reflection of what I think of Contreras. I really like him. But if you're really not trying to contend and you really want to kind of set the stage for the future, you could see the benefit of of throwing Avon Herrera and Pedro Pajas into the fire with Jimmy Crooks waiting in the wings and going, let's see what these guys are made of because if Herrera ends up being the kind of hitter we think he is and he can spend the offseason, it's a big offseason for Avon Herrera, and I would not trade him. That is the first thing I would say. I would not trade Avon Herrera. I think that would be a foolish endeavor, even if they do keep Contreras. I think you need to have a little bit of foresight into what Herrera could become um, because he's already showed you at the plate what he can be. And defensively, I think there are things that he can fix and address in the offseason that can make him a lot more productive and a lot more trustworthy behind the plate. And that would just allow his value to skyrocket based on what he does with the bat. So it's a big offseason for him to be able to, to, you know, take the reins of his own career and try to become that guy behind the plate that the Cardinals feel they can trust into, uh, you know, a, an era beyond whatever Wilson Contreras' contract runs. So those things are happening and you've got the notion of, well, if Arenado is gone, maybe a Gorman shifts back to third, or you could play Donovan at third, or 
you know, so JC is going to be part of the infield mix. Maybe it's it's an, a year where he's having a great Arizona Fall League right now, and so maybe the Cardinals go into next year saying, let's just he's he's going to be on the big league roster and he's going to play a decent amount as a utility guy and and let's throw him into the fire and see what what he comes out the other side. Like those are going to be decisions that I think it's going to be the theme of 2025 for the Cardinals. How much of that can one team withstand and then need certain number of things to go right before the bottom falls out on a season? Like the Cardinals are probably going to be towing that line. There's a chance they lose 90 plus games if they trade multiple among the Contreras, Sonny Gray, Arenado contingent, and the guys that replace them don't end up having the juice. Like those are things that could happen, uh, but it's going to happen with a lower payroll. And like the thing that I is going to be frustrating throughout all of this is we're accepting the premise that the Cardinals are going to lower the payroll. We know that they are. We can't live in the world where we go, well, they shouldn't. That's that's BS. Well, yeah, it kind of is. Um, so I'll continue to bring up the fact that the Cardinals continue to get credit for being this draft and develop organization. It was insisted by the front office that that was something they were good at. And ownership continued to insist that it was something they were good at until the day after the season that they said, well, I mean, obviously we've fallen behind in these areas, and so we're going to bring in Heim Bloom to fix it all. You know, that's what we have to do now. It's like, well, wait a minute. Can you have that? Where's, like, the retribution for the failures, and how was it allowed to get to this point? Well, Bill DeWitt didn't want to talk about that. He didn't want to admit that there was a problem, even though he was, based on his actions and, and, and the whole premise of the press conference, bringing in Heim Bloom, admitting that there was a problem, but they never really had to face the music for that. And so I'm going to continue to be that guy that's a little bit snarky about it because I do think it's it's, just, it's bad business. And it, and it made made the fans for fools. And I do not appreciate the way that the Cardinals went about that. And I don't think a lot of fans do either. Um, but I also, for those who are, are there's going to be frustration about the the whole premise of this offseason that the payroll is going down. It is what it is. It is reality. So I'm going to, while I will probably be snarky from time to time and continue to remind people that, look, didn't have to be this way. Cardinals could have um, basically copped to the the failures of their development program and, and the way that they had fallen behind, and instead of just insisting that, you know, Gary LaRock was was on top of it and he was awesome, even in the, the latter years of his tenure as as director of player development, you, you could have gone, yeah, uh, you know, some of the, the issues of the previous regime are the reason that we're in the position that we're in, but they didn't want to they didn't want to blame anything anybody for the problems, which is understandable. Guy retires, you don't want to basically, you know, kick him on his way out. Um uh, that they, they the Cardinals value continuity. They value the way, you know, the way these things are handled internally, and they don't want to, uh, they don't want to make it look a certain way. But certainly, the Cardinals fell behind in these areas. It's undeniable, and they held a whole press conference to talk about it. But then, in that press conference, the owner of the team showing that he is just, I, I, I don't think as plugged into um, understanding the the frustrations of the fan base and why people are frustrated. You can't just lean on how good you were five, ten years ago. You have to acknowledge, like, yep, we let you guys down, and we asked for your patience, and then we we betrayed it. And so I want to at least be uh, somebody out there that's continuing to say, hey, this happened. Um, but to the Cardinals' credit, I think they're now moving in a direction that is going to allow for things to turn around within the next two to three years. Like, I'm not counting them out from making a surprise run to the playoffs in 25. we got to see what the offseason looks like before I really give my prediction for the season. But, like, I'm not going to say it's impossible, even if they do trim down uh, a lot of the fat and and maybe some of the, the payroll resources that you wouldn't call fat, it's like meat and muscle and, and bone and stuff that you need to be good, um, but they might find another way to be able to replicate that production. 2026, I'd like to keep my mind open to the idea that the the, the FanDuel TV, it's now FanDuel, not Bally, and, and I think the Cardinals will be back with FanDuel, Bally, whatever you want to call it this year um, on, a, on a reduced amount that they'll get instead of like the $70 million they're supposed to get, and it's gonna you'll see that in the, the, the way it reflects in payroll, and they're going to spend less. But I think they're also, I don't know, just it, I don't get the vibe that the Cardinals are e- as eager as maybe as I thought they were to overtake the operation and do it themselves. I think they'd rather keep the middleman, even if it means, uh, you know, less money, because it's going to mean less money. But I, I just, they are going to have the streaming option. We'll see if that brings in some revenue that, that maybe they're able to tap into down the road. But if they have this one-year reset and they win 78 games, but they find out who they can count on for the future and and, and where they need to replace production and maybe do a little more spending. I'm hopeful that by 2026, Cardinals fans are going to get that, but I'm maybe I'm also pretty naive to think that that's going to be the case. But uh, nevertheless, like I, I'm going to continue to just try to talk about this team and, and operate under the parameters that they're giving you, right? But but say where I disagree with it, while also acknowledging reality and saying, look, we can continue to do a podcast every day in the offseason if we want about how the Cardinals need to be top 10 in payroll, 
But we know that it's going to be such a far cry from that in 2025 that it, it's a waste of time to spend a lot of energy on that. So we're going to try to stay in reality for the most part, um, while at least acknowledging that, you know, mistakes were made on the way here. But um, with with bringing in Heim Bloom, and I think Rob Serfolio was a really savvy addition, and I'm impressed by the Cardinals' ability to poach him from Cleveland the way they did. Um, I, I do think things are moving in the right direction. Uh, we won't let the Cardinals off the hook completely, but we're also not going to spend too much time uh, hand-waving about things that we know are just not going to be reality for 2025. So that kind of sets the scene for the offseason. I'm hoping to have more regular podcasts now that there should be news and there should be things to talk about and speculate about. Uh, but let me know in the comments what you want to hear from this channel in the offseason, and we'll do our best to bring it to you. Appreciate you guys for being listeners of the show and your support over the last year and a half for sure since we started up on YouTube has been tremendous. So thank you guys so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time on Be Shave Daily. Peace.